Hello, these are flipped notes 0.7 on sampling and statistics. It's kind of an extension from our last unit on experimentation, so let's get into it. So, where do we get the people who are going to be in our research? So this applies not just to experiments, but also if we're doing a naturalistic observation, a case study, or a survey. The population is everyone of interest to whom a study could be applied. So let's say we are doing a study um, and we want to find out um, what are high school students' views about going on to a four-year college. So our potential population is every high school student in Texas or every high school student in America. Now, in reality, we don't want to study that many people. It would be too big of a study for us to do. So we just want to study a sample, a portion of the population that is part of the study. Um, so we could say our sample is going to come from the high school or from Ellis County. Now, we still have to decide how are we going to pick those people who are in the sample. A random sample is really one of the best ways to do it. In a random sample, every person in that population has an equal chance of being selected. So this is going to eliminate a sampling bias. So let's say we want to ask students at the high school, we could have some sort of computer program generate and pick 200 students and we can interview or survey those students. We could literally put all the names in a hat and draw the names out of a hat. So it is random. With a representative sample, we're going to get a smaller group who is an accurate reflection of the overall group. So let's say that our classes were actually even, that we had 100 freshmen, 100 sophomores, 100 juniors, 100 seniors at our school. Not Red Oak High School, but A school. In a representative sample, if we didn't want to study all 400, but we wanted to study 100, then we would pull 25 from the freshman class, 25 students from the sophomores, 25 from the juniors, and 25 from the seniors. So we're representing, we have an accurate representation of the overall population. Let's say there were twice as many freshmen as there were the other classes, then we would have twice as many freshmen in our study. Um, so, but either way, it is a representation of the percentages of the overall population. In a random assignment, you often hear these terms, and they're actually two of the most confused terms in AP Psych. In a random assignment, we're going to randomly decide once we get them in our study, um, if we're doing an experiment, if they're going to be in the experimental or the control group. More on that in a minute. So here we have in pie format, by the way, pumpkin pie is my favorite. Um, but here we have in pie format, our overall population. And we can kind of see uh, the makeups here with about a third of the pie are, is this blue group, a little more than a third are green, and then this other group here is broken up. In a representative sample, we're going to have a smaller total number of people, but you can see that the percentages are still the same, but they reflect the overall population. An, upper, an unrepresentative sample, this could have been a random sample, and it's not going to reflect those same percentages. So a representative sample or a random sample are the best way to go. Picking people that you like or you think are going to answer a certain way to be in your research, that is not going to be good, and that'll create a sampling bias. So a random sample versus representative sample. Uh, here, if we were actually trying to do this. So let's say we're going to do um, the Axe body spray study, uh, but instead of having one person like Johnny, we're going to find actual guys, like groups of guys. So with a random sample, I would go to the cafeteria and I would randomly find 20 students to be in the study, 20 guys probably, and I'm just say you, 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 I would pick 20. Um, another way to do it is I could go down to the counselor's office and say, all right, uh, generate me a list with 20 random students. That would get me a random sample and that would be considered an unbiased way to find participants in a study. Another good way to get participants to have an unbiased study is with a representative sample. So if I go to the cafeteria and I specifically find four seniors, five juniors, five sophomores, and six freshmen, and let's say we have 400 freshmen, sorry, seniors, 500 juniors, 600 soft, um, can't get words out, 500 sophomores, 600 freshmen. So those four, five, five, and six are actually proportionate to the overall population. So that would also be good because they represent the population. 
Now, random sample, sometimes called random selection versus random assignment. So again, the sample is how we're getting people from our total population. We're going to the cafeteria, we're randomly finding 20 students to be in the study. Random assignment has to do with once we have our, our sample population, we've got our 20 students, now if we're doing an experiment, we have to decide, are they gonna be in the control group? Or are they gonna be in the experimental group? And then we, so this way, we're going to randomly assign them to a control group or experimental group. And again, this is gonna be maybe just like literally drawing names out of a hat or somehow a computer generated uh, list. One more way of gathering a sample in a study is a convenient sample. And this is also a non-representative type of sample. With this, the researcher is just using participants that are easily gathered. So for example, if I wanted to do a survey, but instead of trying to do that survey with every student in the school, I decided I was only going to survey the students in my own class. It would be convenient, but it would not be a good sized group to study. So experimental research, we've mentioned this multiple times now, but the biggest strength of experimental research is that we can determine a cause and effect relationship, that the independent variable caused the dependent variable, that wearing X body spray does cause girls to give somebody their phone number, or wearing X body spray does not cause it, that we can determine cause and effect. The problem is that a lot of times in experiments, it's not real, it's artificial. You know, even the one we're talking about is definitely very artificial, it's not very realistic. A lot of times there are ethical considerations and that'll be in our next section of notes as we talk about ethics and then practical issues. Just, you know, we have so many potential extraneous variables um, that it was really hard to actually try to conduct an experiment like that. So. All right, what do we do now once you've gathered a whole bunch of data, whether it's from an experiment, from a survey, um, through a naturalistic observation where you get some kind of data or through maybe intelligence testing. Whenever you start to have this numerical data, um, now we want to try to understand it all uh, and draw conclusions from it. And that's where the statistics side of research comes in. Um, so we're using math to organize, summarize, and interpret the numerical data. Um, at the basic level, which is mostly what we're talking about here, we're just organizing and summarizing the data. And then the next level is the inferential statistics where we're actually going to try to interpret and draw conclusions. Um, descriptive st um, statistics, you actually are probably pretty familiar with, you just didn't know that we called it this. Uh, and that's using mean, median, and mode, looking at that statistical data. Um, we call them measures of central tendency where we're looking at typical or average scores in a distribution. Um, and we're trying to figure out, you know, like which one, um, you know, what is the most common? What is the average? Um, what is the high and the low? Um, the mode is often going to be with the one that most accurately depicts the typical, um, but it really just kind of depends on the data. Um, I usually don't spend a lot of time practicing this in class because you've had math classes for several years where you've done this. Um, remember that the mean is your average. So if we're looking at intelligence scores, we can determine an average or mean intelligence by adding up all the scores and dividing by the number of scores we have. Um, don't assume that one of those scores has to be the average. It could actually be something that's in between that's not on your original data list. Um, the median is the middle value. Um, remember that you, if you have odd numbers, you just sort the list and the one that is in the middle. Uh, if you have an even number, then you have to figure out the average between those middle two numbers. And then the mode is the value that occurs most often. If all of your numbers are different, then there is no mode. You have to have at least two numbers that repeat to have a mode. Uh, it helps to sort the numbers first and then see which number occurs most frequently, and that is our mode, which is the most typical point in the data set. Um, so here we'll look at um, some fictional kind of numbers here. Um, let's say that these are average starting salaries when you're coming out of, let's go with high school because 20 grand is really not a whole lot when you're, if you'd be coming out of college. So we have 20 grand, 20 grand, 25 grand, 35 grand, or 200,000. What job is that? I want that. So if we're looking for the most typical score, 
we're not going to want to look at the mean, the average, because when we average these numbers together, we're going to get 60,000. And 60,000 is nowhere near what most of these people are making. We have this outlier score that messes up that average. So the mode would be better for finding what is a typical salary or, or you know, how much you're making when you're coming out of high school, because that's more frequent. Uh, even the median is going to be a little more accurate um, than looking at the mean. So it depends what we're looking for, um, but sometimes you have to consider that is there some outlier data that can mess up your other scores. Once you have that, the measures of central tendency, then we can start to look at variability. How much do the score, scores actually vary from each other and vary from the mean? And we can determine that and give it a numerical measure by looking at standard deviation. Um, standard deviation helps us to tell if there is high variability in the data set, like that the numbers are far apart, or if there's low variability in the data set. Uh, and that's low standard deviation, meaning that the numbers are actually close together. Now, you will not ever have to calculate standard deviation in AP Psych. Um, if you take AP Statistics, then that's definitely something where, that you'll have to do there. All right, so here we have two fictitious streets. We have Perfection Boulevard and we have Wild Street. I like to imagine that Perfection Boulevard is like the street in front of the high school, Highway 342. And then I like to picture Wild Street as the street behind the high school, um, Low Ramp. And then Perfection Boulevard, that a lot of the time, um, especially like around on school days, um, people are driving fairly close to the speed limit, that there's a lot of traffic there, it's a school zone, um, kids are crossing the street. So most people are driving pretty close to the speed limit, which let's say it's maybe 35 is the speed limit, um, which I don't remember what it is on school days. But Wild Street, it's wild back there. That's where we got a bunch of teen drivers. We've got people who are running late to school um, and they're driving all kinds of speed limits. They're driving the speed limit, 20 um, over there with the school zone. But then you got this kid who's running late to second period and uh, he's got late arrival and there's nobody else on the road and he's going 50 miles an hour. Um, so there's a lot of difference here in the speeds. Now, both of these streets have the same mean or the same average, 35 miles an hour. but there's a lot of difference in what it actually looks like. You know, on Perfection Boulevard, the cars are going 30, 35, 36, 33, 34. We've got one person going 40, but nothing too crazy. Wild Street, it really is. It's all over the place. We've got 21, 37, 50. There's a big range in where the scores are, or sorry, the speeds are. So if we were trying to compare these streets, the the mean is not giving us an accurate depiction here because um, the mean says, oh, it's the same. But in reality, we know there's a lot difference in how people are driving on those two streets. So our standard deviation is going to tell us, are the scores pretty close to the mean or are they pretty spread out? So here, 2.87, that tells us most people are driving pretty close to our speed limit, 35, or our average. That may not be the actual speed limit. Um, and our standard deviation here is 10.39. That means there's a lot more variability that some people are going real close to the mean and some people are going a lot farther from that. So you don't have to worry about how did they actually calculate that 2.87 and 10.39. I don't even know how, I never took AP statistics. Um, there is a way. So what you need to know is what it means is that when there is a smaller standard deviation, the numbers are closer to the average. When there's a larger standard deviation, the numbers are farther from the average. Now, we can depict that in a normal curve. A normal curve is going to tell us how close scores are to the average. And we're actually going to watch a video in class um, that'll show us curves that represent low variability and high variability. Um, but a few things that we want to know about a normal curve. A normal curve is always in the shape of a bell curve. Um, it's not always a perfect bell curve. It depends on the variability. Um, the number in the middle is going to be our average score. So if we're looking at average scores on a test, whatever the average score was will be here in the middle. And then we'll be able to see how many people scored above the average and how many people scored below the average. Now, 
Some teachers require their students to memorize the different percentages on here. I don't do that. Um, there might be one question on the AP exam that asks about that, and I just don't stress that. Um, but that represents one standard deviation above the mean, two standard deviations above the mean, or one standard deviation below or two below. Um, as far as what I'm concerned about, I just want you to know that these are all the, the curve is made up of the points in our data set. So if this was from the previous chart, these would be all the different speeds that people were going above 35 or below 35. Um, and then how close they are to the average represents their standard deviation. All right, a little bit more here about measures of variance. So in addition to standard deviation, range helps us to see how much our data varies. Range is calculated by looking at the difference from the lowest to the highest point of data. So in this case, with these numbers, with 10 being the highest and one being the lowest, our range would be nine. Now, the standard deviation would be 2.14. Again, you don't actually have to calculate that, but you do need to know what it means. 2.14 would be considered a pretty low standard deviation in this case, so it would be represented by a thin normal curve, whereas a higher standard deviation would be represented by a wider normal curve. So you do want to draw these. The thin curve means that your scores are closer to the average, and the wider curve means that your scores are far farther from the average. Now, it's very common that your scores aren't actually going to fit in a normal curve, and we would call that a skewed distribution. So it's a little bit confusing to tell them apart, um, but the diagram here with the picture helps a little bit. So when you look at the tail, where it's being pulled towards the left, that's being pulled towards the negative side of a number line. So this happens when you have an outlier. So let's say we take a test and our average score is a 70. By where the mean is on this one, the majority of people score higher than a 70, but you have somebody who scored super low. They slept through the test, so they are pulling that average towards the left, so we call this negatively skewed. On the bottom one, it is the opposite. The majority of the people scored below the average or below the mean, but we have somebody who scored really high, and they're pulling it towards the right, so this is called a positive skew. Now, what we found in what we find in data is that the more often you test something, the less those outliers usually occur. And this is called regression toward the mean. That if you were to retest or if I were to retest my class, it would not be likely that I would have those outliers. So it's that tendency for the extremely high and extremely low scores to kind of even out as we retest over time. One other thing that can happen with distribution is that sometimes we have more than one mode. Remember, mode is the most occurring point of data. Sometimes we have two points that there may be two of the same number occurring, and that would be called a bimodal distribution. One final thing here, the percentile rank. Um, you see this a lot when you look at scores for maybe your STAR test or SAT. When you're giving that percentile rank, they're talking about how many people you scored higher than. So if you are in the 86th percentile, 80% 80 of the people who took the test scored worse than you. So it goes to the left. How much worse was everybody else? So what is the next step? The next step is to ask, well, does this confirm or support the hypothesis of our experiment or whatever kind of study we were doing? So hypothesis, hypothesis testing, that's what we're doing with experiments. We wanna know, do our observed findings support the hypothesis? Are these findings real or are they due to chance? Was it just random? Um, for example, in our X body spray experiment, was it just random that girls were liking Johnny? Or was it truly due to that Axe body spray? So in research, when the probability that the findings are low, that it's due to chance, we can say our data is statistically significant. So this is another example of something where you don't actually have to know how they calculate it, um, but there is a way that researchers calculate whether or not things were due to chance. And if there is a less than 5% chance that the data was flawed or that it was random or that it was due to chance, 
we say our data is statistically significant. So it is very low that our data was just random, that it was actually our independent variable. Now, in a lot of research, it's actually pretty hard to get data that is statistically significant, where it's a less than 5% chance. Because like we said, there's so many possible extraneous variables that can become confounding variables. And those confounding variables are used to calculate the statistical significance. But, if, and this is, but this is one of those numbers you need to remember. If P is less than 5%, which is 0 0.05, then our data is statistically significant. When researchers get that, they celebrate. It's a big deal.